All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Please feel free to squeeze in. We don't even get a table, Bill. <laughs> we don't even get a table. <laughs> um, <clears throat> feel free to get closer if you'd like. Um, this evening, um, we are uh, also streaming this on Facebook Live and on YouTube. So it will uh, be there for the future as well. So you'll be able to watch this into the f in the future. Um, my name is Rich Arkinoff, and I am uh, very honored and blessed to be serving as your superintendent of schools. And with me on stage is Dr. Long, assistant superintendent of operations and student services. And I'd like to take just a minute and introduce a few board members that are in the audience. I saw. Our board president, Mrs. Toomey, come in right there. Mrs. Toomey, if you'd give everybody a wave, I'm sure they all know you. <laughs> and back in the back, Mr. Russell. Mr. Russell is coming off of board president, so welcome. He's, and they're here this evening. And all the way in the back there is also our CFO, uh, Dr. Paul Gabriel, is here as well. So. Um, and then manning the booth, uh, making sure that uh, Bill and I do all this correctly, is our Executive Director of Communications, Stacy Conrad. So thank you again for being here this evening. Our objective today is to share with you something that we've been working on, what we call a Vision 10,000. We're going to talk about that. I'm going to do that uh, mostly. Bill and I are going to kind of go back and forth in that. And that is basically our plan to get the district to 10,000 students, and we're going to share with you a little bit about how we develop that. Secondly, we're also going to share with you this evening everything that we've been doing in safety and security. As you know, safety and security is on the minds and hearts of everybody that works in school districts and pretty much everywhere else in the world, but we take it very serious here at Center Grove. So we're also going to share with you all the work we've been doing there. And many of you probably participated in what we call the Thought Exchange. That was a survey that we reached out to all of our community to ask for your input into what we could do to help students in need, mental health, uh, safety, security, just various things of that nature. So um, Dr. Long is going to also share out on that. So that's just kind of a, an overview, if you will, of what we're going to do this evening. And then at the end of the evening, you're going to have a little QR code or you can go to this SurveyMonkey site. So you, if you're a QR code person, you can scan it and go to it. If not, you can just type in this website. You will be able to uh, go in there and take a brief, brief survey. It's about four or five questions. And at the end, we are also going to ask for additional input. So our main purpose in that is to make sure that we're reaching everyone and that everyone's voice has been heard. So when you, when you get a chance, please take the survey tonight. And that will also be available to those folks online. I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. I'd like to recognize Rob Richards right here. Rob, would you raise your hand? Past board member. Thank you. Doc Huber, uh, it's always a pleasure to see you. I see you right in the center there. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Poor is walking in. He is a regular at our school board meetings. And um, Andy, right, down here in front from the Daily Journal. Welcome as well and many, many others of you I see, so <laughs> I won't embarrass you all too much. Okay, so I'm gonna jump right in and talk today about Vision 10,000. And basically, what we've been working on is a way to communicate out using um, some, what I'm gonna set this down here, using what we call aggressive uh, projections. So what we're doing is looking through um, the future Dr. Gabriel, CFO, working along um, with um, a couple of other companies that we work with, one demographer and um, a company, Cooperative Strategies, uh, to help us calculate out and predict what's going to happen in the future with students and growth. As many of you know, we're growing. We're growing pretty quickly. And we want to be able to manage that. One of the things we've been really proud of here in, in Center Grove is that we've been able to manage our growth and keep our tax rate relatively flat. We have always stayed within that dollar mark. So we want to talk more about that. It gets more and more challenging to do that as we get larger. And bigger projects require more need 
and more funding. So we want to talk about that and prepare for that. So as you can see, here we are, and you'll be able to access this website, and more and more information will be added to this. And I want to stress that this is based on what we call aggressive projections. We felt like we would, we would use those numbers that are aggressive because we can always back off of a building project, but it would be awful if we were scrambling to have to build something. So we plan as if we have to do it these days, and maybe we'll be lucky and we can back it off a little bit. So we stay a little, we stay a little aggressive on this note. So you can see as of September of 2018, we were sitting at 8,424 students. So this gives you an idea of how um, the numbers break down in our enrollment. You can see the elementary, middle, and high. So as we track these numbers, we move on to uh, each year and go on to the next. Uh, for example, in 2019, you'll start to see our enrollment change. And we'll go to the next one, thank you. So here we are in 2019. What we um, lo are looking at is 8,688 students. So close to 200 students a year is what we're we're roughly projecting as we grow. So you'll kind of see that grow as we go along. And Dr. Long's gonna jump in anywhere and correct me or add to as we go. Um, <clears throat> so now in 2019, we're looking at that number of students in the fall and a couple of things that we've been working on. One project that we're really proud of is that we've been working together with our Johnson County Sheriff's Department, the White River Township Fire Department, Bargersville Fire Department, um, and uh, other political uh, groups to put together uh, something we call the Emergency Operations Center. And I'll let Dr. Long describe this to you. This is the next project up. Thanks. I, I thought when we were going to do this, this was going to be like pin and teller. And I was the quiet one. I can't remember which one he was, teller maybe. <laughs> um, but I've, apparently I'm going to have to talk. So this discussion started when White River Township approached us about buying a piece of property between Pleasant Grove and uh, Middle School North. And uh, as you know, they are moving their fire station off of Fairview, um, not Fairview, um, Mullen. Smith, Smith Valley. Yeah. The one up by 37 where 69 is going in. Uh, so they, they moved their headquarters and their fire station over there. And we started talking about, gosh, what a great deterrent and what a great uh, quick response if there's something to happen at either of those middle schools. So if you know Mr. Alexander, one of our board members is a former firefighter with the White River Township Fire Department. So we started talking about, gosh, what do we do with the main campus, with Center Grove Elementary, Middle School Central, the high school, Bridges Academy, the Technology Center, the ESC, uh, and the Innovation Center. We calculated out, we have close to 5,000 people in this main campus area on a daily basis. So we thought, gosh, it would be great if we could have some kind of fast response and a deterrent for the high school. White River Township approached us about the possibility of getting funding to add an ambulance to their, uh, to their uh, fleet and, and to be able to put that around the main campus. So we've been working with White River Township Fire Department, Parkersville Fire Department, the Johnson County Sheriff's Department, um, and our, the Center Grove Police Department to try to come up with a location and a, um, a, a building that would house them. So this is directly west of um, the Center Grove High School. Uh, we don't have all the plans detailed out yet, but this is kind of just a footprint of what it would look like. For some of you that have been here a while, it would be right around where the orchard building is. Uh, I was told later that there's a tree over there where kids used to go and fight. Uh, when they were getting out of school. So if you know where that is, you'll know about where uh, this building is going to go. The, the beige building to the left of the picture is where our current maintenance uh, um, grounds crew uh, storage unit is. We have uh, a, a bunch of equipment that we use for snow removal and mowing in, in that building. So we've been real excited. This has been a great project. We've worked with uh, the chiefs of both of those fire departments. We've met with the sheriff. Um, we've uh, talked to both fire boards and our school board about doing this and 
this is something that we're really excited about and think that not only does it provide quick response to our uh, students and staff, uh, but it's also beneficial to the residents of White River Township. Just get broader coverage by all of those departments. And if you've ever uh, kept track, uh, the, the fire departments do quite a bit of runs to the high school and to Center Grove Elementary and to Middle, middle School Central um, on a regular basis. So this will just also help uh, having that faster response and that deterrent. So um, as Dr. Long said, we're really excited about this project and, and uh, it's uh, starting to uh, take shape. So next um, is Walnut Grove. So Walnut Grove is opening up in the fall. It's real exciting. Um, this is based on, again, the growth that we're having in the district. If you had a chance, if anybody's gone down, drove by it, um, it is starting to look exactly like that picture. Um, beautiful building. Uh, one of the things that we are really proud of is that we've tried to reduce our carbon footprint there. It is solar powered. I believe it's about 80% or something like that. Is that right? Or Depends on the month. But Depends yeah, on the month. <laughs> Um, so we're really excited by that. Um, that building then it will, is off of Morgantown Road and uh, will service most of Bargersville and, the, and um, the southern half of White River Township. Uh, we did do redistricting this year. Uh, that building's capacity is 850 and it will open up light. It will open up in the 600s or, or so. And obviously that's for growth if you've been down that way. Things are growing pretty quickly. So uh, that project was planned out and that's a really good example that we had been working on that project for almost five years. That's how long it takes for something like that to happen. In fact, Mr. Richards was on the board when we started, when we even uh, purchased the property or we did a land swap for the property. And uh, that was a little while ago. So you can see that kind of thing takes time in planning it out. So that's what, we, that's what we've been working towards. So as we move forward, you're gonna see now, we're gonna move into 2020. Well, that's actually this May, folks, 2020 will be um, this next May, a year from now. Um, it sounds like it's really, really far away, but it's not. Um, so we have a couple of buildings that are left on the renovation phase. And, re and remember, you can get on this website anytime you want and dig into this. Um, you'll be able to see it. But um, Pleasant Grove is in phase two of renovations. And I'll let Dr. Long kind of share about that. Thanks. About five years ago, we added office space. We added some classrooms uh, on the, um, I guess, uh, towards the east end, the southeast end of the building. Um, we still need to go through and do finishes in all the classrooms, carpet, paint, um, all, all of those types of things. Uh, what we've tried to do, and we've tried to keep it on our schedules, about every 20 years. So when a building hits 20 years, we'd like to be able to, to, to uh, remodel it basically not remodel but just update the furnishes you know you can imagine having 650 kids in there uh, 180 days a year times 20 and now we're at about 26 or so years um, so we, we need to, to update some of those finishes so not a lot of work maybe add another bathroom there but those are the kind of things that that we try to keep on our schedule and our objective is to to not go a long time because when we do, we find ourselves having to do a lot more repairs or a lot more, uh, it costs a little bit more. Like we had gone a really long time uh, without renovating North Grove and Center Grove Elementary. And uh, we're trying to get back on schedule. And that's why we started working on this is when, when do we need to do this and where does it fit on our schedule? And you know, our school board's been really good about trying to, to spread out these big projects so they have a, a minimal impact on uh, the, the tax rate. So that's just kind of the phase two uh, of, of Pleasant Grove. And you might as well go ahead right into Sugar, Sugar Grove. Sugar Grove, again, um, I can't, it's 28 years, I think. Does that sound right? Anybody that's been here a long, a long <laughs> time? So it's been open for about 28 years. Uh, we're due to, um, uh, to, to again, uh, renovate new carpet, new paint, uh, lights, as you know, we're going to put new furniture in all of our buildings anyway uh, at the, at the, before the start of the year. Uh, plus, uh, Sugar Grove is a little bit of a different uh, for us. If you don't know, Sugar Grove holds our houses, our uh, 
uh, our preschool program for our uh, special needs kids, um, that, that program is growing uh, rapidly. And, and that's it's a mandated, it's not a daycare, it's mandated schooling for three and four year olds, right? That's right. That's and, uh, and so we, we have, uh, right this year, we have six classrooms full of preschool students. So they've grown, um, I think when they were at, um, I think they said Center Grove Elementary, we had one classroom, we moved them to Pleasant Grove and we were in two classrooms and then we moved them to Sugar Grove and they've been in four and then five and then six and we anticipate them needing eight classrooms uh, by December of next year. So that's, that's a program that's growing. We're looking at uh, making the cafeteria a little bit bigger. If you've got kids there, ever been there, the cafeteria is kind of small for the number of kids that we have in there. Um, uh, increase the size of the LGI, and, and um, one of their wants or wishes is a place to house all of their kids. If they wanted to have a pep session, or not a pep session, uh, um, uh, an assembly, they don't have a place where they can get all the kids in, in one one space and have them seated and, and to be able to watch anything. So we'd have to address that as well. But that's something that we've been working on and we'll continue to work on with the, the staff there at Sugar Grove uh, as we move into 2020. And one of the things to point out about preschool that makes it very difficult is that students are enrolled when they turn three. So anytime during the year they turn three, they're enrolled and the number, the ratio of teacher and student is much tighter, as you can imagine, and the classroom makeup is much more difficult. Um, with, these are our, stu our most challenged students, some with very significant physical needs between you know, ages three to five, uh, when they turn five and go to kindergarten, obviously, but before that, so there's a lot of need there, a lot of hands-on, and um, what we've been learning, as Dr. Long pointed out, is we are seeing more and more of those students faster, um, but it's hard to predict because we don't know where they're at. And sometimes, the, sometimes we'll have 10 of them show up in a year, and sometimes we'll only have two or three. So we just have to go as we, as we grow. I forgot to mention that that's the location too where we provide speech um, that's uh, therapy for uh, students, whether they're enrolled in our preschool program or just in the community. We also provide speech at, at that location too. So. And Sugar Grove's relatively our center now of our district. If, um, when you look at the population, how dense it is up north, and now it's starting to become more dense south. And so from a transportation purpose, um, it, it really is becoming more the center. Um, next, we move into 2020, I'm sorry, 2020, and we look at also then additional staffing. Now again, it just depends on where we grow. This year we t ended up growing more in the high school, in the middle, uh, middle schools and high schools, uh, but we, we uh, could grow more in the elementaries, it just depends. So based on the aggressive progression, uh, pr uh, I'm sorry, the aggressive uh, projections, we use the, that number to kind of calculate. We believe that in 2020 we'll need probably somewhere around six additional elementary teachers, two middle school teachers, and one high school teacher. Now that's, again, we say May, and that just depends on the growth. And a couple of things to think about, particularly in high school, a lot of things change in high school based on the type of classes students tend to choose. Uh, you can see foreign languages grow and shrink based on students' preferences. You can see, for example, now we have robotics classes. We've never had those before, but now we have had those a year or two. Uh, so then that may mean we need to hire a specific teacher for that kind of class. Now in the elementary, you're always going to have probably an elementary type teacher, right? Um, not, not a lot of variance there. And we do that based on numbers as well. Um, and then middle school teachers, the same thing. Now middle school is a little different as well because you have team time and the teachers are split um, uh, to um, different subjects as well. So there's a little bit there in seventh and eighth grade. So we use that aggressive projections again to determine how many teachers we can hire. Sometimes we end up having to hire more and sometimes we have to hire, maybe we'll hire a little bit less. So in 2020, we're looking at about 8,958 students. So we're starting to climb that ladder towards our 10,000. Um, and that again is what we use to base our staffing off of and our growth with facilities. So moving forward into 2021, 
So in 2021, what we'd like to do is start renovating the middle school north. Now, middle school north, uh, and some folks may not know this, but when we only had one middle school, middle school central had 1,400 students. Um, and now, um, now both schools are, are close to 1,000. I'll let Dr. Long explain that. In, 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 in 1920, um, Middle School Central will be a little bit, about 100 kids larger than Middle School North. In 2020, roughly. not 1920. Sorry. <laughs> well, it was then. Too, but, um, 2020, yeah. 2020. <laughs> yeah. And so this project, you want to share, this is a small renovation at Middle School North. So at Middle School North, we would like to add an orchestra room. As the orchestra, room, as the orchestra program grows, um, we're really restricted. When the building was originally built, they really didn't create a room for an orchestra space, and so they're kind of crowded. It doesn't have the height and the, and the depth necessary to teach orchestra in there, and, and we've seen that program grow uh, so much that uh, we need to add a little bit of space. Uh, we would reconfigure some of those that, that current space into some classroom space. We'd make some, some existing open space and make those into some classroom or instructional space. And then we would move the wall out a little bit and make the cafeteria a little bit bigger. And this is kind of our slow progression to, to being able to house more kids. We'll talk a little bit about if and when the third middle school is going to happen and why we're preparing uh, both middle schools to, to be a little bit larger. Correct. So that moves us into the next year, which would be 2021. Um, oh, I'm sorry. We're still in 2021. Again, looking at that enrollment projection, uh, then we would look at additional teachers. Again, another five additional teachers in the elementary, one at the high school if needed. And so that's, again, another possible growth. And I should also point out, too, that sometimes we've had to add more depending. I think I said this before. Um, sometimes we have to add more kindergarten teachers than expected if kindergarten is where the big jump is. So it may be more teachers. It's just it, it, the really the most important thing to realize is this is very fluid. It will change. It's a living document. It's going to grow as the numbers predict. So um, now we're into 2020. 2021, at the, the beginning of the school year, we're looking at 9,216 students. Uh, moves us into what is that next project and what do we need to do in order to grow. So we're going to go on there, and you'll see that uh, we continue with renovation of both middle schools now. Um, but m the majority of it's going to happen at Middle School Central. I believe, and so I'll let Dr. Long. We, we would that. at this point, we'll, we will be preparing to add more students at both middle schools. So we'll add classroom space at both of those middle schools. Um, not a whole lot of exciting to talk about. Um, this one at Middle School Central, we would also do some finishes, uh, paint and carpet, um, work on any of the flooring that needed to be worked on, uh, because it will have been about 20. Four years, I think, since we had had renovated Middle School Central. Yeah. And so this um, this gives you an idea. Then what we're doing in this process is we're building both middle schools up to to be able to accommodate as many students as we can in middle school. Because as we'll talk about later, building a middle school, building a third middle school, is probably one of the most expensive things to do. And so at, at as much as we can push that out and basically build in our capacity to be able to do that, to keep that tax rate relatively flat, or as little impact to do something like that. It is one of the largest buildings we would build other than a high school. And I know, spoiler alert, we're not going to do another high school. We're going to stick with one high school. So <laughs> in case you were wondering. So in 2022, um, again, based on the numbers, we would have more staff to look at, uh, possibly um, estimated four additional elementary teachers, uh, another middle school teacher, and three high school teachers. Again, very flexible in what might occur there. That brings us at the end of 2022 and into the next year, we're looking at 9,482 students. Again, being aggressive in what we're predicting. And um, as you can see, we're moving forward. 
this again will continue for us to look at what do we do to accommodate students. So with that, we're going to go into the next uh, step, which would be more, um, oh, there we go, uh, more renovation <laughs> would at be, the high uh, school. would be phase two of the high school renovation. Um, we, we anticipate uh, having to add classrooms. Uh, there's some classrooms that are uh, in the building that are um, probably relatively small compared to most classrooms. Some of them are about 900 square feet, uh, really pretty small when you think about having 25 to 30 high school kids in there. So we need to add some, some square footage, uh, or more classrooms for our uh, students and staff. Um, that's really probably uh, what we'll be really focused on in phase two. Uh, continue to do, you know, update flooring and, and painting as necessary. Uh, we're hopeful to get most of that done in this phase one, the, some of the renovations of, of the finishes at the high school. And phase one uh, actually starts now. Uh, as we're going along, as you know, we're putting in a new natatorium and in the old natatorium space, we're, putting in, we're moving our art program in there. Our art program is moving into that, and then we are basically renovate. renovating all the class, classes that we can um, through this first project. And we, I think we grow by about 8 to 11 classrooms Thanks. in this renovation. Um, so uh, next is in 2023, additional staffing based on that growth. Again, I estimated three additional teachers, three middle school teachers, and another high school teacher. And uh, it, it's, we're slowly inching up um, quite a large staff, if you will. I think something to keep in mind that we haven't really talked very much about, and Dr. Arkanoff and, and Jason Taylor, our HR director, have worked really hard to anticipate teachers and administrators and whatever as we grow, but we've not really factored in what additional square footage does for the need for custodians, um, the additional uh, growth of needs for bus drivers, uh, the additional needs for maintenance people and grounds people as we continue to grow. So we kind of monitor that. We have a, a ratio of acreage to, um, to, to, to workers to, that we try to keep an eye on and make sure that we're, we're not growing so fast that we can't maintain them. One of the stories I told Dr. Arkanoff and our board is uh, about two years ago, we brought, bought a software program to help us monitor our work orders, but it also helps us do preventive maintenance. So we've spent the last year or so entering every piece of equipment in all of the buildings uh, that we need to keep doing preventive maintenance on. Well, now that we've got that done, it, it's spitting out about 100 preventive maintenance work orders every month. Uh, so we think that's great because that's going to make our equipment last longer, makes us good stewards of what we already have and so that we don't just have to replace it. But it's also making our guys uh, hustle quite a bit uh, to try to get all those done. That's a lot of work orders in a month. Yeah, and that's a good point. Uh, one of the things you don't see up in here is uh, classroom assistance. Uh, we add those again as needed. Having those calculations depends. We're still working through that. Um, you, you'll probably see some of that information. Additional bus drivers. As we grow and those routes get to growing, we'll need more bus drivers. Additional custodians, Mechanics. maintenance workers. What was Mechanics. that? Mechanics. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all the yeah th that's right. Mechanics um, and um, food service. Food service will grow as well. So those are other staffing items that you'll see there as well. So moving on. Um, so when, when does building number seven start? Building elementary building seven. So we're looking at that roughly starting in around March of 2024. That means that we would estimate be, uh, the construction beginning. As I shared before, you need to be about five years out before you open it. So as you can imagine, we're already out there looking for land and we're uh, planning on how we would uh, fund the next elementary. Now, again, this is on aggressive numbers. So we start now until we get to the point where we have to move forward with borrowing money and, and building. So we'll be, able to, we'll be able to flex that. One of the things that's really important to understand in this whole process in the state of Indiana is that you have to have the need before you build it. So that does mean eventually we will have more portables around schools because we, that's basically the way the funding mechanism works. 
We cannot build a school anticipating that kids will come. We can't do that. We have to have kids here first, and then we can start to build the school, and we can start the funding. So yes, eventually there will be more portables up. Um, and we will have to, and depends on where that growth is, that, that would happen. It could be at the middle schools, it could be at the, at the elementaries as well. So, um, elementary number seven, do you want to say anything else about that, Bill? I don't know if there is. No, you know, uh, like Dr. Arkanoff said, you know, we're, one of the things that we've done differently with this elementary is we're working with a company that's going to help us identify potential growth in, the, in, the, in White River Township so we can identify the right location. We know that um, uh, the I-69 is going to change the, the demographics of White River Township. We know that Johnson County's um, um, a road plan is going to change the demographics and how people move around and everything. So we're trying to take all of those factors in consideration when we select the, the location of the 7th Elementary School. So moving on, we're going to move into uh, the year 2024 and looking at that staffing. So this is where it starts to get, um, well, we got another year yet, I'm sorry. Uh, this is still another estimate of additional elementary teachers, middle school teachers, and some more high school teachers. So you can see it's kind of a formula here as it goes. Um, so we're going on to the next projection. We're looking at, in, at the end of 2024, uh, moving, I'm sorry, at the beginning of the 2024 20, school year, we're looking at about 9,940. Um, that's a little less than five years away. So you can see that's, uh, that's uh, coming, coming quickly. Um, and that number will then drive where we go next with, again, uh, more growth in the school district. So in 2025, um, we'll be, or yeah, 2025, we'll be adding additional staffing as well. Uh, looking at, again, more elementary, we're estimating more elementary, more middle school, and more high school staff. Um, and then we'll take a look at the projections. So we have a little bit of a lull here when we break the 10,000 mark. Uh, so in, t in the year 2025, I feel like that song should be playing, but in the year 2025, we'll be at 10,107 students, roughly. And that um, that will take us um, out to our next, um, our next steps, which would be that additional um, staffing and the opening of elementary number seven. And probably the most critical thing in opening an elementary is that additional staffing. When we open up Walnut Grove, it's happening now. When we open up that elementary, when you open up a building, you have a lot of additional staffing. You have a principal, you have an assistant principal, you have secretaries, you have nurse, you have specials teachers, specials teachers, so art, music, PE. All these folks are completely new to the district, additional staff that you have to add. So it is uh, very expensive when you open up a building. Um, that's, that's why. That's why we wait until yeah. the kids are here because we get funding based on the number of students that are enrolled and so that's why you have to wait that what Dr. Arkanoff was talking about earlier is we need to make sure they're all here yeah. and then make sure we get the funding for that and then we open up another elementary. That's right and that's probably one of the best things about this district in the fact that we stuck with one high school because could you imagine trying to replicate two staffs of high, in a high school how expensive that would be in the programming. Um, and one of the reasons we push off the middle schools as far as we can. So with that, we go into opening the elementary in 2027, location yet to be determined. And um, let's see, and then um, the next thing will be, uh, uh, just basically I know a question out there is, when do you think you would open up the third middle school? What would we say, about 2030? 2035, something like that. Yeah, somewhere in there. Um, again, it could move faster. It may stay right at this speed. We stop here on this timeline. Uh, the, the board asked that we put it to 10,000 students. That's where we get to at 10,000 students. Um, we will be adding to this. You can see down here, you'll be able to go. You just go to our website and type in Vision 10,000 and you'll be able to follow along as we continue to update that and add to it. 
Um, so the next thing we wanted to talk about this evening was safety and security. Um, so we're going to jump into that. Uh, Dr. Long, uh, heads up, our safety and security, it's a big responsibility of his, and he takes it very serious. But um, more importantly, he does such an outstanding job. Um, very proud of the work he's done uh, with our police department and all of the previous things that uh, we've done in the corporation from hardening our buildings uh, to the, the um, cameras and all of those things. So I don't want to steal too much of your thunder, but um, go ahead and jump right into this. Sure. Um, last fall, uh, um, actually it was probably early or late in the, the spring, um, our board asked if we could have an audit done of our safety of all of our buildings. Um, we felt like the uh, Safe Havens International is a world uh, basically famous organization that works with schools and, and college campuses to help them improve their safety. We contracted with them in October. They probably spent, I don't know, about three or four months down here various times interviewing people, um, uh, looking at our facilities, our policies, our practice, procedures, and all that. We, so we want to kind of review a little bit of the, the results of that uh, we, that we got from them. Michael Dorn is the president of, their, uh, of Safe Havens International, and, and it's always nice because I think um, we're probably very critical of what we do for safety because it means so much. It's so, so important uh, that I, I always feel like there's more things that, that we need to do. And, and one of the things that Mr. Dorn showed us was uh, his quote, we found numerous impressive, impressive positive efforts to enhance safety. Um, and then he goes into about 30 pages of, but here's what you can do uh, to get better at that. And, and we appreciate that. And we, we've taken some of those and we've already done some of those. But a few of the things that he talked about was that we have a school police department, our own school police department. Uh, we have canine uh, dogs. We have three different dogs, the narcotics, gun, and explosive detection dogs. Uh, we've, the, the board invested $5 million to to secure the vestibules at all of our schools. Uh, we have an anonymous reporting system that uh, parents or students can, uh, can text, email anonymously and report anything from bullying to um, any kind of safety issue that they might see. Uh, we have 13 certified school spa safety specialists in the corporation. By law, we're, we are required to have one and we have 13. And, my opinion has been that the more eyes that we have on what we're doing in our building, the better off we're going to be. So uh, we continue to keep those up. They have to go to training uh, uh, once a year to, to keep that certification up. We have ThorGuard, a lightning detection system. If the conditions are right for lightning, it will tell us uh, we have it. Uh, for all of our playgrounds, all of our schools are covered, but it's for um, after school events, uh, any kind of practice, track, football, anytime our students are outside, all of our coaches, our sponsors, even the marching band, they get a text if the conditions are right and, and they know to get off the, out of the, get out, so get back inside if they're outside and the detection system goes off. So those were some of the things that uh, he wanted to point out that, that we do really well. But he also pointed out some things that he would like to see us improve on. Some, some live monitoring, faster response time and deterrence. And we talked a little bit about that with the Emergency Operations Center. Um, mental health screenings and counselors in the building to help with uh, the mental health and, and social and emotional behaviors of our students. And then climate and relationships and, um, uh, with our teachers and staff in the building. Um, one of the things that Mr. Dorn suggested was to go look at Littleton, Colorado, how they do all of that, that all-encompassing school safety. And if you know Littleton, um, they had a shooting at Arapahoe High School. And, and um, so they've taken a lot of measures to increase their safety there. Uh, uh, Dr. Arkanoff and Mr. Alexander and Chief Jackson and I went out and visited and, and while I thought we were in great shape and we do a lot of things really well, we went out there and realized that we didn't do quite as much as they were doing, especially in the areas of live monitoring and mental health uh, support for students. Uh, the, the rest of it, we were probably in decent shape, but those were two that I felt like from after that visit that we were, 
that we, there were areas that we could really improve on. Yeah, and I, I just want to say again that um, Dr. Long kind of brushed over it, but uh, when Michael came here and, and uh, he, he did the assessment and met with us, he actually came personally and met with us, he was extremely complimentary of all the work that had been done. So um, again, uh, great job with Dr. Long. Uh, and there's not a lot of money in safety and security that's provided by the state. Uh, so um, I also want to say this is something that the board has found very important and make sure that we uh, put money towards that every chance we can without sacrificing the classroom too much. Um, you know, but all of there, there's no money other than in in the classroom in with the same funds that we have. So Dr. Long spends a lot of time writing grants to get that money and get things going. Um, and, uh, you know, whatever else we can do to get funding for that ongoing cost of safety and security. So um, going into the next area we were talking about. Sure. I, I, don't, I apologize if I come across as gloom and doom. I just want to do everything <laughs> that we can do. And it sounds like I'm being really negative. I'm very proud of what we do um, as a school corporation to keep our kids safe. Um, so I, I'll try not to sound <laughs> too doom and gloom. I say it's humble. I don't so, say it's <laughs> Okay. So live monitoring. So increase the number of cameras, um, add video and audio analytic software. There are cameras out there that you can basically plug them in and they learn. They, they take about six months and they learn what's normal behavior. Uh, one of the examples that we ask them in Littleton to show us is show us something that you learned from your analytical cameras. And so they had a camera out in the, the, their parking lot and it just slowly panned from left to right. And you can see cars going by on the, on the street and everything. And as it's going from left to right, you see a, a truck going, traveling very fast going the opposite direction. Well, it stops its normal panning and it locks in on that truck and it follows that truck to wherever it was going. Unfortunately for this student, he ran into a light pole because he was late for football practice and he was looking over his shoulder to see how late he was. But the camera picked up on that and it knew that that was not normal behavior for that time of the day. So their suggestion is we add more of those and we've tested them out in a couple of our buildings to see uh, add live monitoring of our cameras. Um, we have those up. They're up in probably the principal's office, uh, probably some of the secretaries. I have them. Chief Jackson has them in the high school. The SSOs uh, monitor them. But, but we probably, to, to make them more of a deterrent, need to be monitored in real time, not after the fact, to go back and look to see what happened or anything. Um, Improve our emergency diagrams. Those are for evacuation and uh, fire and tornado and anything else. And develop some photo tours. Really, that's to help first responders so they know when they're walking through buildings, they have pictures. The sheriff's department's been great. They've, they've come through our buildings. They train. They walk it all with their different shifts. So they're doing a really good job. Same thing with the fire departments. They come in and walk it so they know. But we're trying to develop those kind of things. And the, the photo tours, we've done, uh, we, we've made books for all of them, how to shut off our utilities, you know, gas, water, electricity, in case they need to, in case of an emergency. So we're, we're kind of, we've taken those things. We haven't stopped doing anything. We're just kind of running through the things that we can do to try to get done. But those were some of the live monitoring suggestions that, and, that he had. And one of the things about live monitoring that impressed me and was commented there when we were in Littleton was, for example, when that student ran into the pole, uh, you know, they, the folks monitoring, instantly notified, you know, first responders. Because so you can imagine, it could have taken a bit longer. So help gets there a lot quicker that way because they're watching. Uh, they were able to cut down on vandalism. They monitor all of our freezers and so forth. So if one of those goes out, you can imagine the thousands of dollars of food that, that might get destroyed. So um, there is a true savings in that, in that whole system of live monitoring as well as the quick response to, um, to help in, in difficult situations. So some of the fast response and deterrent um, develop standardized emergency plans and we thought we had standardized those but we found some areas that they weren't quite as, as standard in all of our buildings and so we're working almost have those all done. Uh, improve our drill exercise and training programs. And this is where I think, you know, um, 
I was in the military for a while, and before that I was a coach, and we always said, you know, you, you, um, you, you, you exercise how you practice, or you, you, you know, you, you, you do as well as you practice, and, and that's something that I think we need to improve on a little bit, is how we drill in our classrooms. You, you have to be able to drill it so teachers are confident and students are confident, but without creating a mental uh, stress on students about being worried about, you know, are we safe or anything. Um, add dress buttons to the buildings. Uh, we have dress buttons. We just feel like adding them in different locations of the building and making sure all of our staff knows that if there's a, an issue that they have the authority or have the responsibility as well to, to hit those buttons. Improve our access control. We use lobby guard. Uh, we buzz people in with the A phones. Uh, we just think procedurally we could get a little bit better with that. The other, some little things uh, require our staff to wear ID and badges at all times. So you can imagine if we have first responders running in and adults running out or someplace else and trying to identify who's the good person and who's the bad person, uh, it helps to have ID badges on all of our staff. And um, we've been working on getting ready to do that for the upcoming school year. The ability to cover classroom and office windows. Uh, some of our teachers do that pretty well. <laughs> the little one, I had high visibility vests and training for traffic directors. Uh, we have principals that are outside directing traffic. They weren't wearing um, high visibility vests and we, they hadn't been trained yet by the police on how to do that. Those are little things, but there were things that we mentioned. We didn't want to kind of gloss over them. Right, and one of the things that you may or may not be aware of is that we're also putting in a street light over here in front of the, um, cent the central office and the high school uh, parking lot. That will be uh, controllable by the officer. A couple of years ago, we had an officer hit um, out there while directing traffic in the morning. Um, so when we have the five, 6,000 people zipping around here at 7 o'clock in the morning when it's dark and cold, um, that's not a fun job to be out there, even in a highly visible <laughs> vest. Um, so yeah. uh, that's going in this uh, now, I right, think, right? Start, yeah, next um, couple Monday. of weeks. So mental health screenings and more counselors. We, uh, the suggestion was we develop a standardized multidisciplinary threat uh, assessment team. So that somebody that would work with us, if a kid says they're going to hurt themselves or hurt others, uh, to work together with mental health counselors and law enforcement and the school counselors and administrators to, to help those students and not just identify them, but also figure out a way to get them treatment or to get them help. Uh, improve the approach to suicide and self-harm prevention and screening. I think since the report came in, it's mandatory that we train our staff on suicide prevention. Um, all of our staff, um, the high school got a head start on it. They've trained all of their staff last or this past school year or this well, current school year wherever we are yeah. um, we have plans uh, we've partnered with uh, community health they're going to come in and train our entire corporation on suicide prevention and on one of the few programs that the state um, approves for training of, of staff do you want to say anything? yeah and I think uh, some one important piece to, to point out here is that while the state created the uh, law the requirement for suicide prevention training there was no money that was provided for it. So you can imagine trying to train all of our staff, which roughly is about 1,200 people, if you include all our part-time and uh, substitute teachers, to train that many people in mandatory suicide training. Um, it takes, a, uh, takes some time and money. Uh, so that's a, I think it's another. two hours in length, right? I believe so. Two hours in length, and I believe what, a mandatory in person. So it's not one of these trainings where you can just say, hey, go online and do it on your own time. So there's mandatory in-person training too. So. The other issue, and I, I think this has been, I, this is, I just finished my 21st year at Center Grove, and I think this is something that we've worked on every single year since I've been here, is climate in the buildings, relationship, uh, and social, social and emotional. Uh, um, improve our approach to bullying prevention. I, we've said this for over and over that our students need to feel there's some one adult in the building that they're comfortable with and they can go to with their problems. That was part of our initiation of the anonymous reporting, that if you don't have somebody that you're comfortable with, you can at least report it anonymously that, hey, I'm getting bullied or my friend is getting bullied and 
third period class or whatever. So, um, but, but also the climate also includes working with our parents so they understand what we're doing and, and to be able to team with us to help us uh, work with students that, that are having issues. Okay, um, next we're gonna talk about the thought exchange. Um, as I shared back in March of this year, we, we did a survey, a thought exchange, if you participated in that. Um, it's a unique system, uh, it's online, um, it's, kind of, it's a survey, but it allows you to uh, put in and respond to the questions and put in as many thoughts as you would like and then people rate those thoughts. So, um, so we had two specific questions that we wanted to ask. One was what are some important things for us to consider to ensure our schools are safe places for our students and, and staff? And the other one was what can we do to support your students' social and emotional well-being at school? And what we saw is the, the responses kind of blended together. Uh, we had 1,236 participants. Uh, 934 thoughts so you could log on there and say I think we need to improve the safety at the entrance of our buildings uh, and then anybody else any of the 1236 other people can go on and give that a rating of one star to four stars so we had 32,412 ratings we were really pleased with the, uh, the the participation that we that, that we received from this and then so we went through with the, the thought exchange company to help categorize the uh, the, the the areas that, that the parents we, we surveyed parents uh, staff and community members anybody that we had an email uh, for we, we sent them an email what we found was they they corresponded a lot with um, the mental health, the fast response, and live monitoring. And then we kind of put the circle around it. That's the climate and, and the relationship and social and emotional well-being um, that, uh, that, that we think is, is kind of uh, that overall arching blanket that, that protects and helps the students. Yes, and, and that's a really the, probably one of the biggest and most important parts is the relationship. As Dr. Long said, we want people to connect with our kids. Um, you know, from uh, bus drivers picking up our kids first thing in the morning, they do a great job. I've ridden a lot of our buses, and they know the kids by name. They, they, uh, they know who to wait for. They know that one that's always slow getting out of the house and running to the bus, um, you know, and, and so they have that relationship. Um, uh, also, our teachers in the classrooms, sometimes, you know, kids connect with their own teacher, and sometimes they connect with the teacher down the hall or the music teacher, the art teacher, or the classroom assistant. So we, we need to spend more and more time about building relationships with one another. But that's probably one of the biggest things that we can do um, as a school district, especially as large as we are, um, is helping kids feel like they have someone that cares about them, you know, not just at home, but in this school district. So some of our top thoughts, um, mental health services should be provided to all students, not just those that, that are Medicaid recipients. Uh, provide mental health resources and licensed counselors in every building. Um, mental health support and evaluations for troubled students. Uh, and more mental health services for all students. These are the top thoughts in, in this area. They receive four stars uh, in the rating system that we have. So these you know, they're pretty self-explanatory. We thought it was interesting um, that our community felt that mental health was as important as we did. Yeah. Um, the, the thoughts for cl in climate relationships, social, emotional, they got three, these are the top star vote getters. They got 3.8 stars, uh, drug and alcohol issues, um, uh, openly discuss safety and well-being with our students. Uh, additional support for teachers uh, in the classroom. Uh, we have students that just have emotional outbursts that make some of our students feel unsafe in the classrooms and we need to be able to, to deal with them. Feeling safe, I, I like this one, does not only mean feeling that a bu building is physically secure, but feeling safe also means feeling safe to be yourself, safe to share and exchange ideas, and safe to speak up. And these, like, these two um, different areas in the thought exchange say a lot about our current situation as a society. We have seen more and more 
behavior problems in our schools um, and across the state, um, which is a challenge. And we know mental health has a lot to do with it, but we also know the social emotional learning side of it. There's a big, you know, big conversation going on across the country of what it might be. It could be everything, you know, from uh, just, uh, you know, electronic devices, uh, you know, to Opioid. opioids and um, just all, everything in between that. Um, so while that is a big discussion uh, as a school district, we have to bring every kid in, love them, and, and get them prepared for school and work with them as best we can. And um, sometimes uh, that can be a big challenge depending on what some kids bring into school with um, their own emotional state or mental health issues. The other thing I'd like to point out about mental health is mental health is not special education. Mental health is a medical issue. So we are not trained to deal with medical health in the education profession. So I want to make sure I kind of lay that out there. That's, that is not an expectation that we put on our teachers to be mental health experts, nor do we put that on our principals. It just wouldn't be right to do. No one's had training in that area. Um, it is a medical issue. It's not protected by special education laws. Um, it is something outside of that. So, um, but the reality is we're going to have to figure out how to work with it and deal with it. And that's one of the things that we're looking at um, through this thought exchange. So security response time and deterrence, again, these, these are the top thoughts. They got a 3.7. Um, always lock doors uh, and hallways in the event, oh, I'm sorry, a way to close and lock doors and, and, and hallways down in the event of emergency. Uh, need to have common sense, easy to follow safety plans. That's obviously uh, uh, always a goal of ours. Um, the fast communication to parents, this was one of the top ones. And, you know, I, I think Stacy and her department and the principals do a great job of, of getting that message out fast when we get the information. But we also joke that nothing beats home a text from a student. You we're not, never going to be faster than a, a text home of, hey, we're in a lockdown. I don't know what's going on. Or, hey, you know, we were in a bus accident and, and everything. So we'll continue to work on that and, and just be as fast as we can. Um, I thought there was one. Sorry. Okay, good. Um, the one that I was, um, the building safety, this should include both during and before, during and before and after school. Uh, we keep a lot of focus on what we're going to do when students are arriving and when, they di when, when we dismiss and any visitors that we have during the school day. But we also realize our schools are open. Um, we have a lot of people, a lot of after, after school activities. And you look at tonight, you know, I think we have the lacrosse um, uh, end of the year dinner. We have this event. We have swimming going on. There's probably other things. Maybe the band's down there getting ready or the choir's doing some of their stuff. But we have a lot of activities in our building after school hours and we need to keep remembering that we have to keep our building safe really all the time. And if you've been in the high school, it seems like there's something going on about 370 out of the 365 days because there's everything. Uh, the last one, we'd like to see a resource officer in each building. Uh, if someone wants to get in and harm others, they could do it. Having an officer in each building would be a deterrent uh, and protection. So that's the thought exchange and the feedback from that. Um, you can actually go to our website, uh, slash thought exchange, and you can see this in more detail. You can drill down into it, click on it. You can go as far as you want, stay up all night, get some, get some Twinkies and you who and and dig right into it if you want um, but there is quite a bit there when 32,000 plus um, you know ratings on there you can see quite a bit so as we wrap up now and again I want to thank you all for coming out we're gonna have you share your thoughts here you can do that right now by going on your device if you want um, you can shoot that uh, the survey is gonna close for those of you that are on, fa on Facebook or YouTube you can also do this again the survey is gonna close on Wednesday uh, we want to hear from you the board wants to hear from you uh, but please take time now to do that again thank you for coming in dr. long and I'll step down and we'll be out towards the back, and we'll be uh, glad to just uh, talk with those that uh, as you uh, exit out today. So thank you very much, and everyone have a great uh, evening.